Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Mark of Library Associates, and uh, we welcome you uh, here today. Um, before we get uh, uh, started, I uh, want to mention our uh, next uh, lecture, which will be on April 23rd, same uh, place and same time, when Elizabeth and Malcolm Ingram from Syracuse University Department of Drama will be here to talk about uh, acting Shakespeare's sonnets. Uh, this is the annual Mary Marshall Lecture, and it will be followed by a reception for uh, members of Library Associates at the SU Bookstore, uh, where members will receive 25% off uh, on general books and uh, college apparel. Um, so much for the commercial. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Daniel Citrum, uh, professor of history at uh, Mount Holyoke College. He's here to speak about uh, Jacob Reese's uh, New York, uh, based uh, on his uh, recent book, Rede Rediscovering Jacob Reese, um, Exposure, Journalism, and Photography in Turn of the Century New York. Uh, Dan is the author of uh, quite a uh, famous book in the history of uh, uh, media studies. Uh, and if, if you've been discouraged by picking up books that claim to be part of media studies, uh, forget that and try this one. It's called uh, Media and the American Mind from Morse to McLuhan. Uh, the book has been translated into Chinese and Spanish and uh, has been in print for some 27 uh, years. Um, Dan is also a co-author of Out of Many, a uh, history of the American peoples. In its sixth edition, it's a widely used uh, uh, textbook. Um, one of the best-selling college textbooks on uh, American history. And uh, he's a member of the executive board of the Organization of American Historians. Uh, among his interests, he serves on the executive committee of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, the world's largest collection of historical uh, sources documenting American involvement with the Spanish Civil War. And um, uh, this uh, collection is housed at, the, uh, at NYU's Tamament Library. And another of Dan's interests is the history of New York City. Uh, you may have seen him uh, on uh, Rick Burns' uh, New York, the seven-part uh, uh, PBS history of New York City. He was also involved in the production of that uh, work. And that same interest brings him here today to uh, talk to us about Jacob Rees. Dan Citron. Now it's my turn. <coughs> Is this on? Yes. I, I, <coughs> I can't tell if I'm a rock star or I'm working at McDonald's. I, I, OK. Uh, thank you, David, very much. Um, and uh, it's great to be here in Syracuse. And I've got uh, a couple of old friends here that I want to acknowledge. Um, Peggy Thompson in the history department, who uh, endured graduate school with me in Madison back in the 70s and uh, as an old friend. Um, and uh, in fact, I remember Peggy had me here about, I don't know, about 15, 18 years ago. I, I think of these things in terms of the Syracuse basketball team. It was the Derek Coleman, Billy Owens era. Um, <laughs> but that was a great visit. Um, and of course, David, um, who was one of my oldest friends, we were in college together. I've known him since uh, we're 17. Uh, he's been a, uh, not only a great friend, but a, a great intellectual influence on me. And uh, uh, I want to dedicate this talk to him. So um, uh, thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> OK. Uh, I want to try to keep this informal today. Um, what I've brought with me is a, um, I hate the term PowerPoint, but it's better than a slide projector these days. Um, it is a collection of images that I call Jacob Reese's New York. And it grows out of the work um, uh, that uh, went into this book, Rediscovering Jacob Reese. Um, and let me say a few words about the genesis of that project, and then I'm going to dive right in. Uh, I've got about 40 images that I want to show. Um, some of them are Reese photographs, but a whole bunch of them are sort of pre-Reese. Um, and so I want to try to bring you back uh, to uh, the New York of the Gilded Age, the New York of especially the 1890s, 
um, <clears throat> when Reese was so active. Um, but this book began, um, it's a collaboration between myself and Bonnie Yokelson, who is an historian of photography. Bonnie, for many years, was the curator of prints and photographs <clears throat> at the Museum of the City in New York, where the Reese collection is housed. And uh, we didn't know each other, uh, but she was interested in, in trying to do more with that material and wanted to get a grant from the NEH. Um, she reached out to me. Uh, it was sort of, you know, uh, uh, as I say, she knew some of my work. We didn't know each other. Um, we got to talking and we uh, collaborated on a grant uh, from the NEH, which we got, uh, which basically supported the research for this book. Uh, and the collaborative research program of the NEH, the premise is you bring together scholars from different uh, disciplines to work together. Uh, and so Bonnie was the historian of photography and I was the historian of New York and somehow it was a match. And um, uh, the book has got uh, two long essays uh, uh, with a lot of photographs and my essay is called Jacob Reese's New York. Bonnie's essay is really much more concerned um, as you might expect uh, from a historian of photography, with really with questions of provenance. What are these photographs that we call Jacob Reese's uh, uh, photos? Um, uh, it turns out that there are a lot of complications in identifying who took what picture. Uh, <clears throat> there remain sort of uh, controversial and complicated questions that Bonnie was trying to get at. Who actually took the pictures? Was Reese a photographer himself? Was he an artist? Did he think of himself as a photographer or an artist? Uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, <clears throat> my angle was kind of different. My angle was, I was really interested in the world that Jacob Rees uh, worked in, lived in in New York. Um, I've had a long-standing interest, as David remarked, uh, on the history of the city, particularly in the Gilded Age. Um, and so I dived into this um, really as an historian and as a detective, um, looking to answer some questions. Um, many of you, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm betting, are familiar with Rees's photographs. Many of you have studied them as students or have perhaps used them in the classroom as teacher. Um, I, I certainly, uh, in both those categories, um, the pictures continue to have a very, very, as we'll see, I think, um, you know, deep impact on people. Uh, Reese as a writer is more problematic. I'll get into that as well. But the point, larger point for me is I was less interested in sort of the critical evaluations of Reese as a photographer, uh, less interested in some of the more recent cultural studies approaches to Reese, although I, I certainly don't mean to uh, uh, totally toss them out. I was more interested in, in specifics of time and place. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, and so I'm going to dive in here. And um, <clears throat> Jacob Reese, as many of you know, I'm sure, uh, was an immigrant himself. Uh, he was born in this small uh, town in western Denmark called Ribe, um, which he left at the age of 19 uh, to emigrate to New York City. Uh, this is in 1870. Um, and uh, Reese was something of a lovesick puppy. Uh, he, uh, the reason he immigrated basically was because the woman he wanted to marry wound up engaging herself to another man. Uh, and it's a reminder that the reasons that people emigrate are really various and always have been. Um, but he came to New York in 1870 um, with at least a few um, advantages that most immigrants did not have. Uh, number one, he had some working knowledge of English. His father had been a school teacher. Uh, and uh, number two, he had a skill. He was trained as a carpenter, um, which has, um, <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, made him uh, you know, already above most uh, of the working class in the United States at that time. He comes to New York in 1870, has a very, very rough time of it. Um, he uh, basically uh, bounces from job to job. He does some itinerant selling, uh, does some work in lumber yards and shipyards. Um, one of the things we were able to do with our grant was um, Reese kept a pocket diary in Danish when he first arrived his first, first few years. That diary is at New York Public Library. We were able to get it translated into English, so we were actually able to use it. And so it allowed me to sort of trace Reese's early years in the city. Um, as I said, he had a very tough time. Um, kept a diary, um, was really uh, not only lovesick but homesick, uh, and uh, eventually in the 1870s uh, drifted uh, into the world of journalism, taught himself to be a telegrapher, uh, and in 1877, Reese landed a job at the New York Tribune, where he worked as a police reporter. Um, and this was a, a great way for anybody uh, to really learn what I would call the underside of New York, because to be a police reporter meant that uh, every day you got up and went down to uh, police headquarters on Mulberry Street, uh, and you went out with the cops on their various rounds. And in those days, uh, the police department was uh, as much about, uh, well, this is maybe a euphemism, social services, as it was about catching criminals. I mean, the police department in Gilded Age New York is responsible for everything from removing the carcasses of dead animals to <coughs> helping lost children to fishing bodies out of the river, uh, all these kinds of things, accompanying doctors who would uh, try to vaccinate people in tenement districts. Um, in this way, Reese really learned New York um, in, I think, a very, very deep and profound way. 
Um, and uh, so he, he's covering the cops and all these different things. He's writing stories all the time. Um, but in the mid-1880s, Reese's journalism takes a different turn, and it takes a more serious turn, I would say. And he begins to focus on what is emerging as one of the most um, intractable and, and, and sort of worsening problems in New York City of the 1880s, and that is the enormous increase in tenement housing um, and the reality of overcrowding, uh, of disease, uh, sanitation, and public health problems uh, that are beginning to really uh, spiral out of control <coughs> in lower Manhattan. Um, and uh, I'd like to read a little something from my book just to sort of um, put some flesh and bones on this. Um, Reese's journalism also began taking a more serious turn by 1884. He continued to churn out exposés of Gotham's mysteries, laudatory articles on the New York Police Department, human interest stories exploring racial difference, and the routine beat writing required by his job at the Tribune. But Reese found himself drawn to cover the most overwhelming and rapidly worsening problem of 1880s New York, the deteriorating conditions of tenement house life. Part of the story could be reduced to staggering statistics. By 1880, over 600,000 New Yorkers lived in 24,000 tenements, each of which housed anywhere from four to several score families. Overcrowding kept getting worse, as in one Mulberry Street tenement that housed nearly 200 people in small apartments meant for 20 families. Thousands of buildings were in terrible sanitary condition with seriously defective plumbing, and often no ventilation or sewer connection. Above the first floor, water was unavailable in many of these units, contributing to the, scourge, the scourge of diarrhea, which every summer killed some 3,000 children below the age of five in New York. Of the more than 16,000 cases of contagious diseases reported annually to the authorities, the vast majority were found in tenement houses. So the point I'm trying to get at here is that and if you study the history of New York housing as I have, I mean, it's an incredibly dolorous and depressing story. The point here is that by the middle of the 1880s, Reese is making this, this the focus of his journalism and is beginning to do more investigative reporting and beginning to become an advocate uh, for certain reforms. Um, but all along, he was very, very frustrated uh, by his ability to communicate what he saw in words. He was thinking about other ways to communicate what he had seen. The other point that has to be made, it seems to me, um, is that Reese, um, in his most famous book, How the Other Half Lives, um, and some of the later writings, uh, people remember and think uh, Reese and think of Reese often as sort of the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the man who founded housing reform or the, the fight against tenements. And in fact, it's it's more complicated. Reese is, I think, much more of a synthesizer, uh, and was actually building on work that had been done for many many years. Uh, when he writes How the Other Half Lives in 1890, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, he really is uh, drawing on a lot of work that had been going on for at least a generation. <coughs> and I'm going to show you now some previous images. Uh, because I want to talk about the emergence of tenements um, and the social and political issues that were raised. Uh, during the Civil War, as many of you no doubt know, um, the draft riots in Manhattan constituted the most violent insurrection in American history. And there was a riot that lasted for four days that basically paralyzed Manhattan. And in the wake of the draft riots, there was tremendous concern among uh, elites in New York about the sanitary, social housing conditions uh, of, the, of the neighborhoods that produced the rioters, to put it uh, bluntly. Um, and so the first few images I want to show you here come from a report that was done in 1865 by this Council of Hygiene and Public Health, um, which extensively documents the sort of the housing situation in Manhattan at that time. This is Rivington Street in the Lower East Side. These are some of the earliest sort of tenements um, that were built. The law defined tenements uh, as any building where three or more families lived separately. Uh, and of course, even by the 1860s, many of them were much larger. Um, the Council of Hygiene report also documented this kind of, of um, sort of reality on the streets. There's a public school on the left, um, and over here you have a slaughterhouse. Um, and this was the situation that, that many people, not only in kids in schools, but also people living in tenements faced um, on a sweltering hot uh, day in the summer. You might want a breath of fresh air and open a window if you had a window, but that also meant smelling what was right next door to you here fat boiling, uh, 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 slaughterhouses, other so-called so nuisance industries are very common in lower Manhattan at this time. Also, by the 1870s, certainly, you begin to get uh, more and more of these sort of popular representations of tenement living um, in books, guidebooks to the city, and also the popular magazines of the day. Uh, and one of the things that was so striking to me, and I, in doing a lot of this research, um, was to see this sort of thing. This is Harper's Weekly, which, of course, is the preeminent 
uh, magazine of, uh, of genteel America at this time. Um, and on the cover, what you see here is uh, a sweltering night in New York, and this is depicting, and this of course was, was uh, a, wi a wide practice, people uh, looking to escape the heat uh, by sleeping on the roof. Um, <clears throat> and um, what really was striking to me, though, was the story that accompanies this, this photo, or this, uh, I should say, this cover, um, you know, is, is cheek to jowl with other stories, with titles like Life on the Amazon River, or The British in Afghanistan, uh, or the politics of the Zulu nation. In other words, tenement dwellers in New York are depicted as just as alien and just as exotic as people from other continents. Uh, and so there's a way in which people are trying to come to terms with this new form of living, uh, and especially this overcrowding. And um, <clears throat> it's another sort of representation here, a pen and ink drawing from uh, um, Harper's Weekly, Rag Pickers Court. This is a, a colony of people who pick rags um, for a living. Some of the older charity groups in New York, the AICP is the Association for Improvement of the Condition of the Poor, it was sort of the oldest, most prominent Protestant charity in the city. Um, even in their uh, annual reports, you begin to see these kinds of pre-photographic uh, representations of the tenement, what I'm calling a kind of a visual turn that takes place in the 1880s. There's a growing uh, 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 sort of uh, chorus of voices. They're not really organized, but people expressing concern. I want to read you a quote just to give you a flavor of what I'm talking about, because one of the real issues for middle class and upper class New York um, was the idea that people who lived in the tenements essentially were not fully human. Um, and um, in 1879, I'm reading a quote here. This is a, a, a speech given by a Park Godwin, who at the time was editor of the New York Post, one of the dailies in the city. Um, and he said a, 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 a meeting that's talking about the problems of tenements. And he says the following in 1879. Home as you and I know it is not understood in the tenement houses of this city. To us, it is the center of the sweetest and most generous affection, the place in which, con in which concenters all the intercourse of life, and which lifts us to a very paradise on earth. These black holes in the wall are not the homes you and I know and love. But my friends, they are the only homes that half your people know. They are the homes where intemperance is nursed, crimes are nourished, the modesty of girlhood is crushed, and the innocent instincts of childhood are stifled in their birth. Families are crowded together in such a manner that it is impossible for morality, even in a Christian family, to flourish. So there it is, this sense that New York is increasingly now populated by and coming to be dominated by people who live in these places where morality, certain Christian morality, is impossible. Um, and so when Reese gets involved with the tenement house, um, <clears throat> uh, the tenement house uh, 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 issue in the 1880s, there's already uh, a lot of, uh, of this kind of representation, both in the magazines. Uh, there's a certain amount of, 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 uh, of uh, 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 certainly critical discourse around this. Um, so I want to make that point because, I mean, the idea that we somehow invented this whole crusade or invented this issue uh, is really an exaggeration. Uh, one of the things that people pointed to, of course, too, was the growing um, uh, uh, proliferation uh, of cottage industries in tenements, so that people actually working in the tenement apartments. And one of the common industries uh, at this time was um, cigar making, uh, you know, the cigar trade, rolling cigars. And uh, people understood that there was a price to be paid in terms of health uh, as this illustration from Frank Leslie shows, uh, with these kids all sort of drooped over. Um, and, um, but of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the family wage, so to speak, uh, was, uh, was the key to profit making in this kind of enterprise. Uh, there was also a great deal of concern uh, with uh, uh, the homeless. And of course, uh, in New York, as in any other big city at the time, whenever there's a depression, whenever there are hard times, there's a great upsurge in homeless people. Where do they go? Uh, in New York, the place of last resort um, is the lodging house uh, of the local police station, generally the cellar. Um, and uh, uh, Reese himself stayed in one of these places in 1870 when he first came to New York, had a terrible experience, was robbed. Uh, when he complained to the desk sergeant, he was laughed out of the station. Um, so this stuck with him, as I'll show you a little later on. Now, at the same time, of course, uh, in the political world, uh, the 1880s, not only in New York but all over America, is a time of increasing class tension, uh, growth in, in labor movement, uh, nights of labor, the emergence of the AFL. New York City in particular uh, uh, saw a lot of violence at this time. We tend to forget that New York, uh, that, not New York, but the United States uh, it probably has uh, as much class violence at this moment as any nation uh, on, on, the, uh, on the globe. 
Uh, Reese himself uh, was very conservative, both politically and temperamentally. It's one of the things that I really got out of those diaries and some of the other writings I looked at. Um, when this was all happening in the mid-1880s, Reese is really worried, like many Americans were, with the growth of class uh, uh, struggle. Uh, he was certainly not a socialist, uh, was not even really a liberal, uh, and in fact, uh, at, right at this moment, Reese is turning toward evangelical Christianity, uh, becomes active in a local Methodist church. He had been raised as a Lutheran uh, in Denmark, but becomes a Methodist, um, and as these kinds of scenes uh, that were very frightening to people like Reese. And once again, these kinds of scenes, I think, offered more of a spur to people who were uh, looking for ways to deal with the tenement crisis. This, by the way, is um, uh, a, uh, <clears throat> a street railroad strike in New York City. This is Grand Street, uh, if you know Lower Manhattan, running east and west. Uh, and here what you see are the police uh, not only you know, breaking heads uh, here, but also literally driving those streetcars. The police department would frequently act as sort of scab labor uh, in these days. So. Um, you know, these kinds of scenes are increasingly uh, uh, common in the mid and late 1880s. Uh, in 1887, uh, Reese reads about a discovery in Germany that excites him. Uh, somebody has invented uh, what becomes known as flash powder, uh, magnesium phosphate. Um, what this means for photography is simple. For the first time, by creating a light with this flash powder, you can now take photographs in places where there's no natural light. Uh, and this is the kind of thing Reese had been looking for. And so in 1887, 1888, Reese teaches himself the rudiments of photography. Um, and with the help of several other amateur photographers, he begins going around in the tenement districts of Lower Manhattan, taking pictures of what he sees. What does he intend to do with these pictures? Well, you can't really publish them in the newspaper yet, because the technology for halftone reproduction is not there. And so instead, he decides he's going to take these pictures and have uh, lantern slides made out of these pictures. And what he does is he gets about 100 of these, f these photos, um, makes the lantern slides, and, it be and before he does anything, he copyrights, and I found this in the Library of Congress, uh, uh, his papers, he copyrights a slide lecture called The Other Half, How It Lives and Dies in New York City. And for the next two years, this is 1888, 89, 90, Reese travels around mostly the East Coast, uh, the Midwest, giving this slide lecture to audiences mostly of um, Christian groups, churches, YMCA's, Christian reform groups. Um, and uh, we know about this for, from a number of, of, of sources. Number one is this thing was reviewed as an entertainment in the local papers. I found amazing reviews of Reese's talk uh, in New York papers and, and other papers in other cities. Um, and so people are fascinated with the photos. But they're also interested in the whole presentation. Uh, Reese offers what I call in the book a, a vaudeville of reform. It's really like a vaudeville show. He's showing images. He's um, often telling dialect jokes, using humor, playing some music, all underlaid with a very strong Christian message. Because what's clear is that Reese is appealing to the audience, uh, and he's really not that interested, certainly, in mobilizing or appealing to the people who are the subjects of his photographs. He is really appealing more than anything else to people's sense of Christian charity, philanthropy. He's throwing down the gauntlet, really, uh, particularly to these Christian audiences and saying, what are you doing about this? What are we doing about this? Um, 1889, uh, he publishes an article in Scribner's uh, based on this lecture with some illustrations. And then that leads to a book contract in 1890, How the Other Half Lives. Uh, is published. And it's really the first book to make extensive use of photographs, although in the original book the photographs are mostly very small and um, they are um, in many cases uh, reproduced as woodcuts. Um, but the book becomes a, a bestseller, uh, allows Reese to quit the grind of daily journalism, and he spends uh, the rest of his years uh, on the lecture circuit and also continues to write books. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Battle with the Slum, The Children of the Poor, there are a no number of others that he writes uh, before he dies in 1913. Well, let me get back to that slide lecture for a second, because one of the things that we found is one extant copy uh, of a stenographic uh, account made of his lecture. It was done in 1891. And so I went to that account, and luckily it includes the pictures that he was showing at the time when he was talking. And so what I'm going to do here now is show you um, a bunch of the pictures that appeared in the original slide lecture that Reese produced. Uh, I'm not going to reproduce the lecture. That would be really bizarre, and I couldn't do it anyway. But um, I, I want to give you an idea of, of the kind of the visual rhetoric, if you will, that Reese used. He would start uh, very often with this photo, one of the first ones he took, Gotham Court, 
this was uh, two tenements. It was the largest tenement um, in New York City. Uh, something like 500 people lived in these two buildings. Why does he start with Gotham Court? Uh, because Gotham Court was located on Cherry Street, and as he pointed out in How the Other Half Lives, it was about a stone's throw from where George Washington had lived when he was President of the United States, and New York was the temporary capital. This is before they built the White House. And so here's Reese in 1890, talking about 100 years ago, 1790, when the President lived right here. And the point he's making is that you can go in this court and go in these buildings, and you will not find one native-born American. You won't find one person, you know, speaking English as a native language. And so from there he goes on to talk about what he calls um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, studies in the tenements. Um, Reese would often flatter, uh, and very often flatter, his uh, audiences by juxtaposing slides and saying, look, um, here's what things like the Five Points House of Industry can do. Here's what we can do. We give, especially these kids, off the street. Um, a routine. We teach them the habits of sobriety and thrift and, and, and prayer and so on. Um, and uh, here's another example of this. Uh, we need more Christian philanthropy. We need more people to pay attention to this and make it their business to, to make a difference. If we don't do this, we wind up with this. <laughs> so these are all from the earliest pictures that, that Reese took, uh, as I said, 1888, 1889. And, you know, in the spirit of informality, if anybody wants to ask a question or jump in here, please feel free. I will have a more formal Q&A afterwards, but I want you to feel free to <laughs> say something if there's something that has to be said. We just talked a great deal about um, the choices that people made and the choices, you know, making the right choices and what happens when you made the wrong choices. And there's a kind of, you know, very much of a, a sort of a moralistic overlay in this lecture. Uh, this is a, an example of, of, you know, a place you could stay for seven cents a night um, in, in uh, a lodging house in, in Baxter Street uh, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, now, this is one of the more famous Reese photographs, and this is one that really allows us to think about the method that he used. Uh, Three o'clock in the morning, Reese comes into this tenement uh, on, um, <coughs> on Baxter Street. Uh, he's got at least one other photographer with him, and he's got at least one policeman with him. So it's a party of, say, four or five people. Without any warning, they burst into this apartment. And in order to light this flash powder, you literally had to fire a gun. You make a loud sound, boom, and this flash comes. Of course, these people have no idea what's going on. And five cents a spot. Basically, it's an illegal boarding house. And if you look here, you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people in this picture that we can see. And it gives you that sense of the immediacy and there's no posing here. It's a totally uh, a spontaneous shot. And it's done in the dark. How can you compose a picture if you can't really see uh, anything through the camera? And How the Other Half Lives, this is how the photo was reproduced in this ink drawing. As I said, many of the photos, uh, you know, got this treatment in the book. Sorry? It was downtown. Oh. Here's another one of these shots where they're coming in the middle of the night and just taking these pictures um, uh, of a, uh, a, 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 an apartment in, in Bayard Street. If you, you can see, I don't know if you can see from where you are, but these people are looking up and they're sort of like, what's going on here? Uh, this is another one of, of Reese's more famous pictures, uh, Bandit's Roost. Um, if any of you saw the movie um, Gangs of New York, the Scorsese film, there's a very strange scene in which they reproduced this photograph, which was actually taken 40 or 50 years after the movie is set. But, you yeah, know. That one was an exposure of those, the previous photographs. Yeah. They went in at night. Yeah. Very brief. It's just a, sec a second. This is not a formal portrait. This is just you have to get that light and you explode it and it's there for a second or two. Yes? When were those tenement buildings actually constructed? Were they done for the immigrant? Uh... Okay. Um, it's a good, great question. One of the, the terrific things about how the other half lives, it still stands up in some ways, is that it offers a history of the evolution of the tenement. And the point he makes is that the first tenements basically um, are old commercial buildings, in some cases mansions from the 18th century. Uh, as people moved uptown, and as, as the, uh, um, the, especially the merchant class moved uptown out of lower Manhattan, they left behind these houses, and they would be subdivided, sublet, 
uh, and subdivided even more. And so the first tenements really are these old 18th century mansions and, and other uh, uh, commercial buildings uh, that are, are chopped up to apartments. But certainly by the early 19th century, uh, the, the, the housing crunch in New York is so great, especially with the, with the, uh, the crush of, of migration, that you begin to get this booming market in the, bu in the building of, of tenements. Um, so, uh, and in many cases, this is something Reefs, I think, didn't pay enough attention to. Most of these tenements are not owned by wealthy absentee landlords. They're owned by immigrants themselves. Uh, and, and tenement building, housing construction, um, you know, was a very uh, uh, sort of popular and uh, lucrative uh, small business for people who were able to pool capital uh, and build these buildings. Yeah? How prevalent was the dumbbell Say again? How prevalent was the dumbbell design? Well, that's a very interesting question, whether you know it or not, because the dumbbell tenement, which is the, the two tenements with the air shaft down the middle, that was um, first um, uh, conceived in 1879. That design won a contest for new model tenements. And then 20 years later, people were saying the dumbbell tenement is the worst thing that's ever happened to us here. Uh, the problem kept getting worse. Uh, even these so-called model tenements turned out to be pretty awful in many cases. Um, anyway, I want to show you this, just an example of the kind of thing that happened. So they would tint this slide when he was showing it very often. Uh, and you get this is a very, very different effect. Did the tenements become um, self-segregating by nationality, religion, language, or <laughs> no. you took what you could take? No, I mean, you know, certainly, and again, I'm loath to make generalizations. We're talking about a lot of people and a, and a large swatch of time. But I, I still, I take your point. I mean. Um, we know for sure that, that, that it was common for a particular building or even a street to be filled up with the, uh, the people from a particular town or city of, of let's say, Sicily uh, or Russia uh, or Austria-Hungary or, or wherever. Um, but that generally didn't last very long. And I think one of the things that, that, that was new about all this was this incredible mixing um, of ethnicity and nationality. Um, but it's something that Reese really Play, paid a lot of attention to because one of the things about how the other half lives, and this is I think so interesting, and, and I think speaks to the the jarring impact it has today. I mean, the pic a lot of the pictures. Let me do a little bit more of these. The police lodging house became one of the objects of Reese's crusades because he had himself had such a terrible experience there in 1870, um, and in the 1890s Reese led a crusade to close police lodging houses. Uh, and to try to set up some kind of municipal lodging system that would get these people out of the, of the police station. So he took a lot of these kinds of pictures. Um, and you'll note in many of these that, of course, in 1890, people are not that used to having their photo taken. Uh, and there's a lot of this sort of camera shy stuff. People don't want to look at the camera. Um, but get back to the point about how the other half lives. Um, the book is organized in part around chapters based on ethnicity and nationality what Reese calls races. We would not use the term race today uh, to describe ethnic groups or national groups. Um, and I think one of the real jarring problems for students today or, or any of us today is that you look at these photographs and you say, wow, these are interesting. Many of them have great empathy and sympathy. They draw you in. But then you read Reese's text and it's full of what we would today think of as the grossest kind of stereotypes um, and generalizations about, about quote unquote races. Um, but I think it's important to look at this a little more deeply because, uh, you know, rather than being presentist, which is always easy, let's think about why it is that Reese organized his book that way and remind ourselves that Reese, like almost all other educated Americans of the day, um, you know, uh, had his views of society and especially of history shaped by the application of Darwinian theory. Um, in other words, the idea that you can understand not just the biological natural world, but also the human world in terms of the struggle for survival, survival of the fittest. This was a powerful, um, uh, uh, really, foundation theory for a lot of folks at this time. And so Reese in How the Other Half Lives has chapters on, you know, a chapter on the Jews, a chapter on the Chinese, a chapter on African Americans, a chapter on uh, Germans and, and Italians and so on. Uh, and there's a kind of a topology, a ranking of these quote unquote races in the book that I think reveals a lot about the quote unquote scientific and progressive thinking of the day. Uh, so who was ranked at the top? Well, maybe it's not a big surprise. The Germans. Uh, Reese himself was Danish, Northern European, Protestant. Uh, <clears throat> the Germans and also the Bohemians or the Czechs uh, seemed to fit what he thought was needed for, uh, uh, you know, to be, become a good American citizen. You know, they're sober, they're industrious, uh, they're clean, they're hardworking. Um, ranking farther down are, are other groups. And interestingly enough, African Americans rank pretty high in Reese's typology, certainly way ahead of the Jews and the Italians and the Chinese. 
You might think, well, why is that? That's interesting. Why does he think so highly of black people in the book? <clears throat> and I would suggest three answers, uh, three reasons. Number one, um, black people are all American citizens. Number two, they're all Protestant. And number three, they all vote Republican, uh, which was important for Reese because Reese himself had become a Republican, became very tight with Theodore Roosevelt, first as police commissioner and then as governor and later as president. Um, so in some ways, Reese tied his own uh, uh, wagon to, uh, to Roosevelt's star. But um, when you go down that list, the real problem comes with groups like, well, certainly the Jews and the Chinese. They're not Christian and show very little inclination to become Christian. Um, and then, of course, the problem of the Catholics, the Italians. Well, are they Christian? It's not clear. Are they white? It's not clear. Um, and perhaps at the very bottom, the Irish. Interestingly enough, there's no chapter on the Irish and how they have lives. They sort of float above the whole thing as a kind of a black cloud, you know. And why is that? Because Reese identified the Irish um, as being not only the oldest uh, 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 you know, white ethnic group, but most importantly, he identified the Irish as being um, the people who ran the city, and especially the people who ran Tammany Hall, uh, the Democratic Party machine. Um, and he had uh, tremendous contempt for them. Uh, so I, I'm just opening this up a little bit, the whole question of, of how he ranks those races, uh, what he called races. Uh, and um, in these pictures here, one of the things you're seeing is Reese's um, horror uh, at, at the mixture of races, uh, what's called a black and tan dive. In other words, a place where both blacks and whites might come to drink. Uh, and of course, New York as a port town, ever since the 17th century, had always had uh, a multiracial component. Uh, but this is something that was very, very tough for Reese himself to, uh, uh, to um, Did take. Did um, hierarchy uh, then figure later in the uh, 1927 Immigration uh, Act? Very much like yeah, well, I think what you get by the 20s is a much more scientific, much more, uh, quote unquote, scientific, much more quantitative, much more highly elaborate attempt to, to do exactly that. Um, and, and, but he's one of the people, and again, th this was mainstream thinking. I mean, this is nothing radical. I think for, particularly for students today, it's very jarring to see this kind of language, but it's always, I think, important to take this as a teaching opportunity and to think about it. Uh, don't just feel superior to it, but try to understand what's going on here, um, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, one of the other sort of racial tensions that Reese was very concerned about, um, opium dens, um, which did exist, uh, not only in New York, but in most big cities. Um, and of course, uh, the real problem from Reese's perspective uh, was uh, that uh, very often white people, if you look at this guy carefully, he sees an Anglo, uh, become addicted to opium. Uh, and white women become addicted to opium. Uh, and this raises, of course, uh, all, you know, the, the, the worst <coughs> issues for, for people like Reese of, of race mixing, miscegenation, uh, and so on. Here's how this was reproduced in a, in a book around the same time. Reese would often end his lecture with these kinds of images about, you know, this is what happens if you don't stay on the straight and narrow. Um, Blackwell's Island currently, Roosevelt Island in New York where the city jail was, going to the island. <clears throat> this is Potter's Field. This is actually the first picture Reese ever took. Uh, Hearts Island in New York Harbor. Reese estimated that 10% of all New Yorkers were buried in Potter's Field. That is 10% of the city wound up in a pauper's grave. <coughs> now, uh, as I mentioned, How the Other Half Lives uh, was a big success. It allowed Reese to, to, to leave um, the, uh, 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 the world of daily journalism. He continued to write, though, and to lecture. He only took photographs for a very short time, though. And it's a really interesting issue, because uh, when Reese died in 1913, he put a lot of loving care into preparing, right before he died, his papers, which he deposited in the Library of Congress. But no photographs. Where were the photos? And in fact, it's not until 30 years later, during World War II, that Reese's photographic legacy was rediscovered. There have actually been several rediscoveries of Jacob Reese. Um, Alexander Aland, a photographer and a critic, uh, had read about Reese and was interested in, in him, wondered where these pictures were that he had seen and how the other half lived. This is, you know, 50 years after they were taken. Wound up tracking down one of Reese's uh, 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 grandsons and said, oh, I know what those pictures are. They're in the house in Richmond Hill in Queens where Reese had lived. They went out to the house, went up to the attic, and sure enough, a giant steamer trunk with 400 glass plate negatives had been there for at least 30 years. Um, Alain rescued them, uh, had new prints struck. There was a big exhibit of Reese's uh, uh, photographs at the Museum of the City of New York in 1948. Uh, and there, Reese sort of all of a sudden is uh, seen now as the founding father of social documentary photography. 
uh, ground zero for everybody who followed, from Lewis Hine to uh, Dorothy Lang and, and, and Ben Sean, the FSA photographers, W. Eugene Smith, that whole line of social documentary. Um, there's some problems with that, though. Uh, because Reese, it turns out, didn't really think of himself as much of a photographer, uh, was certainly not politically liberal, um, and in some ways the meaning of the photos and the use of the photos certainly has changed over time. But his photographic practice did evolve, and I want to show you some of these other pictures, which I think are, are quite remarkable still. Um, after those first pictures where mostly he's sort of, you know, as we saw before, uh, sort of uh, 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 taking these shots spontaneously and breaking into people's houses. Reese also does other kinds of photography, uh, more of these kinds of portraits. Uh, and also, he begins to get to know the people that he's photographing. Instead of just going into somebody's apartment and taking a flash, he's going to places like this. Um, this is a family, as you can see, uh, four people working here, uh, rolling cigars. Um, he was uh, appalled at the idea that people were doing this kind of work where they lived, uh, tried to, to help Roosevelt and others. Uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to eliminate this. Uh, in fact, they, they failed uh, because uh, uh, court decisions kept overturning laws that were passed. Um, but now you see Reese is doing something similar here. This is a sweatshop on Ludlow Street, the Lower East Side. This family is all working uh, as part of the, uh, the subconscious of the sweatshop system. Uh, you get paid 45 cents for every dozen knee pants that you sew. Um, and so this is, uh, uh, as I say, a Jewish family that Reese photographed uh, on Ludlow Street. 45 cents a dozen. Yes? Did these children just go to school or just stay home? Well, of course, there's no compulsory schooling. Um, and, um, you know, most people don't realize this. Uh, you know, in 1900, what percentage of Americans had graduated from high school? It's about 3 or 4 percent. The number of people who stayed in school through high school was tiny. Uh, and I'm sure that, that most people probably did not even get an eighth grade education at that point. Uh, so probably most of these kids are not going to school or not going to school for very long. You begin to get more of these, as I say, these kind of portraits. Uh, Italian rag picker. This is on Jersey Street, almost like a Madonna with child. But also, I think Reese is beginning to understand that the distinctions must be made among and within these various immigrant groups. So, I mean, this woman and the family is obviously very poor, but clearly there's also, you know, an attempt to keep clean. They keep the hat up here. You got the dustpan and the broom, whatever people have. They're trying to keep the place in order. And I think after How the Other Half Lives was published in, in his later years. Reese began to, I think, um, you know, to change and, and evolve a little bit. And I think he began to realize that there was a fundamental contradiction between, on the one hand, uh, this idea of types or that, that, na that nationalities or races can be, uh, you know, turned into these types on the one hand, and on the other hand, the great American tradition of individualism and the idea that anybody can rise up uh, and be something different. Reese, I think, in other words, begins to see that within the tenements there are a great number of differences among people. Uh, uh, even within ethnic groups. I showed this picture a while ago and somebody in the audience blurted out, this looks like something from the Holocaust. Uh, and I, something clicked in my head and I said, you know, I can see how you make that connection. This is a guy that Reese interviewed who had slept down there for four years. This is a girl named Katie. Uh, that Reese found at one of the industrial schools in, in uh, Midtown Manhattan on the west side. Katie was nine years old, um, lived with um, two of her brothers and a sister. She kept house for them while, she, uh, while they went to work, and she would also occasionally uh, get work around the neighborhood scrubbing people's floors. So Reese asked, what do you do? She said, I scrubs. Nine years old, did not go to school. <clears throat> This is the picture we chose for the cover of our book. Um, such an interesting collection of faces here. Uh, Reese is at this Beach Street Industrial School. These were some of the first schools that later become known as vocational schools. The idea was to try to teach girls and boys the rudiments of, in the girls' case, housekeeping, cooking, sewing, that sort of thing for boys, maybe the, the rudiments of a trade. These girls, uh, one girl is Irish, one girl is black, one girl is Italian. Uh, they were selected to be the monitors for the first election in this school. This is the Board of Election for the Beach Street Industrial School. And this picture was taken in 1892. What was the, um, uh, the issue in this election? And the issue was, should the students say the Pledge of Allegiance every day before they, they start class? And of course, it won. Uh, and Reese liked to tell this story as a way of, of you know, uh, this notion of the public school as the great assimilator 
the public school is where kids are going to learn to be Americans. Some of the photographs that Reese took of the police station. Uh, in 1896, uh, largely as a result of Reese's efforts, the city closed all these lodging houses, uh, and uh, uh, people who were homeless no longer were forced to stay in the basements of, um, of, of police, uh, police uh, 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 precinct stations. It turns out that there are more of these pictures than any other topic that Reese photographed. And again, I think it's largely because of his own you know, you know, sort of residual bitterness and anger about how he was treated uh, when he had first come to New York uh, 20 years earlier. Now, this is a photo that's been uh, actually written about by, by uh, uh, several art historians. Um, it portrays a scrub and her bed. This is a woman who's a, a scrub woman. She's an alcoholic. She's fairly old. Um, she stays in a lodging house in a police basement, police station basement. The plank is her bed. Um, Certain claims have been made for this photograph, and this is where you get into the whole question of, is he an artist, is, it really, is he a real photographer, and so on. I'm less interested in these questions, but just for the sake of, of the discussion. Um, you know, the claim is made, look at the, at the careful uh, composition, you've got the, uh, you know, the contrast of the, that, circular, that, that oval stain and the board, you've got this mysterious hand here. Uh, it turns out that this picture was another one of these ones that was taken with the flash, in the dark, no composition, no, no chance to see what, what's there. The hand is probably Reese himself. Um, so, you know, people want to ascribe artistic qualities or a certain intentionality to a lot of Reese photographs, but there's some real question as to whether, you know, th th that, that fits with the historical record. Of course, th that never stops art historians from doing anything, but, you know. Uh, you know, for me, the question that's more, the, you know, the, the value of Reese's photographs is less around the question of, was he an artist? Was he the first social documentary photographer? It's more about this amazing record of the lived material conditions in New York City. Um, and <clears throat> uh, put another way, uh, the title, How the Other Half Lives, of his most famous book, the title of his most famous book, uh, is in many ways an ironic joke. Uh, because Reese is not talking about the other half. In 1890, out of the 1.6 million people in New York City, 1.2 million are living in tenements. So the other half is really the other three quarters. I'm not arguing that all those people's conditions were as bad as some of the ones you've seen here, but most of them were pretty terrible. Uh, and I think for Reese, and this is something you see in How the Other Half Lives and, and uh, uh, his other writings, um, that sort of specter, that, that, that threat of social disorder, of the draft riots, uh, of social chaos coming out of these tenements is the thing that hangs over all this. Um, and certainly, Reese talks a great deal about the fact that these are the folks who are going to be running the government. Uh, as he says, uh, the first line in his book, The Children of the Poor, is this, the problem of the children is the problem of the state, by which he meant not that the state has to take care of all these people, but rather that um, these are the voters. Uh, and there's a political crisis looming here uh, with this with this population uh, and, uh, and and the generations of people living in these tenements, people often ask me. This is, I just want to show you this uh, other photograph here. This is an all night in a two cent restaurant. This is another one of these spontaneous shots. Uh, this is a restaurant where you can go and and you know you can have a meal or drink beer, and then if you want to stay all night, you could. Um, so Reese goes in the middle of the night, and you see people in various stages of either drunkenness or sleep or something in between. Um, this picture, like a lot of those sort of um, flash ones, you know, it's got that sense of, of spontaneity, but also that kind of chaos and disorganization that I think um, reminds a lot of people of more modern photographs in some ways. Um, people say, well, what's Reese's solution for all this? For a guy who's doing all this writing, taking these pictures, devoting his life to the problems of the tenements and the tenement neighborhoods, well, how does he propose to solve it? Uh, and the answer is, is disappointing, it seems to me, because Reese doesn't really have a solution. Or put it this way, he says, my solution ultimately is what he called philanthropy plus 5%, by which he meant rich, <coughs> philanthropic Christian gentlemen build model tenements and agree to take only a 5% rate of return on their investment. Um, I mean, of course, uh, it's not until the 1930s that we get the massive intervention of the state into the idea of not only slum clearance, but also the building of public housing, with mixed results, as we know. But the point I want to make here is that, that we should not be lumped in um, with 
you know, New Dealers, the left liberal tradition, all that sort of stuff, which he is often, you know, people often claim him as, the beginning, but it, it really is, is not the case. As I said before, his own politics were very conservative. Um, he was much more of an evangelical Christian than anything else. Um, and he was really about arousing the conscience. I do think Reese deserves a lot of credit um, as, I would argue, the first muckraker, uh, the first person to really use uh, a photography to try to illustrate uh, um, social ills. Um, and uh, really, in, in many ways, the first progressive, too. Um, because Reese also likes to bring in statistics, um, scientific testimony. Um, he is really, more than anything else, as most of the early progressives were, uh, trying to arouse the conscience of people who he believed would then act on what they saw. Um, uh, as I said before, he becomes very tight with Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, by the time Roosevelt becomes president in 1901, uh, Reese is also something of a national celebrity. In 1902, he published his uh, autobiography, The Making of an American, which was also a bestseller. Um, sort of a classic tale of how an immigrant you know, makes it in America. Um, interesting to compare that book to another famous autobiography published the same year. Uh, Booker T. Washington's Up from Slavery, and those two books have actually a lot in common in terms of the rhetorical style, the appeal uh, particularly to uh, wealthy uh, foundations, Protestant charities, and so on. It's all there. Um, but Reese himself as an influence is not, I mean, his influence not lasts very long. I'll put it another way, um, by 1900, uh, Reese is already seen as something of an old-fashioned guy uh, by a lot of the progressives. Um, he's not scientific enough. He's not rigorous enough. One of my favorite quotes is uh, from Reese's 1905. He says, um, we have gotten to be sociological instead of neighborly. Um, by which I think he meant, and this I think goes back to his small town roots and who he was. Um, Reese, I think, finally didn't like cities that much. Um, he was a small town guy. Uh, and in many respects, he has one foot in the 19th century, one foot in the world of Victorian moralism, uh, one foot in the world of sentimentality. Uh, the other foot, I think, looks forward to the 20th century, uh, and as I suggest before, uh, is a kind of harbinger of the progressive movement, of muckraking, um, and of the enormous power of the photograph uh, to try to change people's consciousness uh, about conditions. Um, by 1905, this kind of slideshow has become in some ways commercialized. You can purchase for $18 a slideshow called The Shadows of a Great City or The Slums of New York. And I put this up here only as a reminder that uh, very soon after Reese's breakthrough, the use of photography, you know, as a commercial uh, uh, enterprise obviously is booming, but the use of photography in the service of reform uh, is also something that is going to be, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, a very a prominent part of every reform movement uh, ever since uh, uh, this era. Um, so, um, as I said before, Reese dies in 1914. Um, and the photographs are largely forgotten for 30 years. Uh, they've been rediscovered and rediscovered and rediscovered again. Um, I still think that, that in many ways Reese speaks to us today. Certainly some of the key problems and some of the thorniest issues that he was trying to wrestle with are with us today. Um, the structural reality of poverty, particularly in the cities, uh, the issues of new immigrants and their, uh, how they fit into America, uh, the, the whole question of, of, um, of child labor, uh, which is still with us. Uh, and, you know, as I said before, the, the, the fundamental belief that all you need to do is rouse the conscience of the nation to solve a problem. It's a fundamentally uh, progressive belief. Uh, turns out things are a little more complicated. Uh, nonetheless, though, uh, I think Reese is, uh, uh, still speaks to us in so many ways today. So thank you very much. <laughs> And we are open for questions, rants, whatever. Yes? Was there no friction between people of different language background, uh, color, skin color, etc.? Was there? Yes. What do you think? Well, I would expect, but you don't mention it. <laughs> well, I can't cover everything, but yes. I mean, I think that, that uh, um, you know, I mean, uh, th 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 there's, I mean, Reese, it's interesting, when you read what he, what he says in the lecture and some of the stuff he wrote, he always is trying to leaven so to speak, his, spe his talk with, with jokes, with comments, little stories, because I think he, he, he felt that this stuff was so heavy and that the, uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, he tells a story of when he goes to see a, um, he goes into a, a really terrible uh, basement uh, apartment and he goes into this basement apartment and he discovers that there are four families living in this one, one room in the basement. Each, each family has a corner. Uh, and he goes up to one of the, the, the husbands and he says, how do you people all coexist here? And the guy says, you know, well, everything was going great until this other family started taking in borders. 
You know, so you know, it's a kind of joke about overcrowding uh, and what he saw. Um, but yeah, there's no question that, you know, I mean, that's part of the reality of, of big city life, I think. Uh, the tension between different ethnic groups and sometimes, you know, within ethnic groups too. So, yes, absolutely. Yes, in the back. Yeah, it's an entrepreneurial thing. I mean, I think somebody who buys this is looking to make money. This is not something you buy and show at home, you know, to your family. This is something you take on the road. And, it, you know, it, we tend to forget, and this is right at the beginning of sort of the dawn of the Nickelodeon era and, and motion pictures, but these kinds of, of, of um, commercial exhibitions, whether it was slides, uh, panoramas, cyclorama, uh, sort of pre-cinematic entertainment, these things were very common in the early, early 1900s. And I, I expect this is one of those, you know. You take this on the road and travel around the summer, set up your, your, your slide, it your, wouldn't be a slide projector, it would be a, a lan magic lantern, what they called. And th that's, I think, would be the market for it. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Now, it's a great combination, isn't it? Is, is that true about Republicans? <laughs> oh, sure. Sure, the black, the black vote is solidly Republican until really FDR. Yes. I mean, remember, the Democratic Party is the party of the South, the party of the Confederacy, um, and uh, so, and throw in the, the, the very, very deep, uh, often violent history between African Americans and Irish in New York City. The draft riots were also a race riot. Um, and, uh, you know, blacks are being, are being hung on the, street of New, on the streets of New York, uh, primarily by Irish immigrants. Um, so that's another reason why blacks in New York don't want to vote Democratic, because that's the enemy for all kinds of reasons. So, yeah. Yes? A comment and a question. Okay. The comment that he phrased the survival of the fittest is Herbert Spencer, not Charles Darwin. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the point, though, is that the popularization of Darwin, and you're, you're absolutely right, not, not Darwin at all. The question, did Reese have anything to do with the introduction of pasteurization by Nathan Strauss, or was he related in any way to it? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can tell you that he was plugged into that growing network um, of reformers, for example, the Social Settlement House people, Lillian Wald uh, in, in New York, uh, Jane Addams in Chicago, um, uh, Josephine Shaw Lowell, the Charity Organization Society. Um, he was very involved with those folks. Um, I don't know if he was involved with Nathan Strauss's campaign at all. Um, I, I'm tending to doubt it because Nathan Strauss was also identified with Tammany and actually was the Tammany candidate for mayor in the early 1900s. So that was kryptonite for Reese. Yes. I you said that he was politically conservative. Yes. Did he have any uh, contacts with uh, anyone like Upton Sinclair who wrote uh, Jungle? Yeah. No, that, that's my point. I'm, I'm saying that, that it's a mistake to put Reese in with people like Upton Sinclair, Lincoln Steffens, John Reed, all those people. In fact, one of the real traumatic moments, I argue in the book for Reese, it comes in 1886 when there was a very um, sort of tumultuous and, and, and very important election in New York because that year, you have a Tammany candidate, Abram S. Hewitt, you have a Republican candidate, Theodore Roosevelt, and you have the labor candidate, Henry George, the great reformer, the author of, of Progress and Poverty. And, and uh, George was all about mobilizing the labor movement. Um, he was not really a socialist, but he was certainly a radical. Um, and, you know, Reese was appalled at that, and, and, and he, you know, wanted nothing to do with that. So I'm saying that, in fact, it's precisely the upsurge of labor socialist thinking that pushes Reese out of politics and more into the evangelical movement. Yeah? When does Reese begin to think of himself as an American? And uh, how, what does that mean to him? Yeah, that's it's, it's by negative inference in the pictures you had access to the journal, which is fascinating. Yeah. No, it's a great, a great question. And I think, you know, the, the real answer is in his autobiography, The Making of an American. And, you know, I think that, that that one of the reasons it's, it's considered a classic autobiography, immigrant autobiography, is because from the very get-go, there's no conflict, there's no question, there's no issue about, oh, you know, what's happening to my old religion, my old culture. It's all about becoming an American. It's all about how quickly and how desperately he wanted to be accepted as an American. Um, what he leaves out, of course, is a, a, a 
suggested before, some of the advantages he had and, and some of the, the, the ways that it was easier for him to assimilate. Um, but there's, there's no uh, uh, doubt that, that that was his trajectory. And um, in fact, uh, you know, one of his favorite sort of uh, uh, blurbs that he got, of course, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said that, that uh, Reese was, was sort of the, the, the most useful citizen I ever knew. And he loved the idea that, 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 you know, that he had achieved this idea of, of being a useful citizen and an American citizen. Um, so, uh, but as we know, for uh, you know, sort of white Protestant immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, um, you know, they are, you know, in some ways, they have it easier uh, than most of the immigrants uh, from Southern and Eastern Europe. And they are seen as easier to assimilate. You know, the problem, quote unquote, beginning with the Irish, and then later with the Slavs and the Jews and, and the Italians and, and the rest, um, is can these people be actually be assimilated? Can they become American citizens? Um, and that's, that's contingent, you know? As are all our definitions of race contingent upon historical space and specific time. Uh, and I think that's important when, when reading Rees to remember that. Um, Yes. Which was a very different background from, from what the later immigrants came with. Yes. They came with, uh, you know, push carts and they were, they, they had been in ghettos, whether mm -hmm. they were Irish, right. they had been disenfranchised by the British, right. but they brought to this country a very different background. Yes. It's an important point. You, you, it's really well taken. I mean, we, we tend to forget that there's tremendous difference, class difference, other differences within these various groups. Um, and so I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think part of what Reese is dealing with and what a lot of people are dealing with is the, the sheer numbers of these strangers. I mean, I, you know, really the, the, the migration, the so-called new immigration of, of Eastern and, 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 and Southern Europe uh, really begins uh, about 1880. Uh, and, you know, within the course of 10 or 20 years, New York City is remade by people from these other places. And uh, they look and seem and sound a lot more foreign. Uh, and as I suggested in some of the things I read, uh, you know, for many people, they're, they're sort of not fully human. Um, and one of the things I think that, that, that Reese deserves credit for is, is a kind of humanizing um, of the immigrant and immigrant experience. I mean, he still has his prejudices. There's still the stereotypes. But on a lot of these photographs and a lot of the writings, especially as he got, gets older, um, I think Reese offers a much more, um, as I say, humanized sense of, of these immigrants and, and, and of their lives. Uh, and, you know, the idea that, you know, you can grow up in a small, tiny, overheated apartment and still, you know, raise a family, you know, your kids go to school, you work for a living, you, you're a regular person. Of course, that was the great majority of, of immigrants' experience. How many people have ever been to the Tenement Museum uh, on Orchard Street? Down in, uh, I, always, I have a very mixed view of that thing. I was, I was talking to my dad a while ago. He's, he's still going strong in 88. And I said, Dad, you want to go down and check out this Tenement Museum? He looked at me and he said, they want me to pay to see that? You know, because he, he grew up in a place uh, very much like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Tenement Museum is very popular. And, and it gives people some sense of, of, you know, what this world was like. It was a building built in 1863. And it was closed in 1931 because the owners at the time did not want to bring it up to code, which would have meant a bathroom in every apartment. So in most of these tenements, you'd have four apartments on a floor and then one bathroom. Everybody shared. That's right. And so the refusal to bring the code, to bring it up to code, so they closed the building. So like for 50 or 60 years, and then it was bought and by this foundation and turned into this museum. Um, I've seen people there, you know, you see young people especially looking at these apartments saying, you know, that's, that apartment, I'd take that right now. <laughs> because the housing is still so tight in the city. Um, where I really got off the bus, though, was when they started this program, which I think they discontinued, of having, you know, it's like if you go to Plymouth Plantation or Colonial, and you have the Colonial Williamsburg, you have people churning the butter, or the actors at the Tenement Museum. And so, yes, yeah, so you knock on the door, and, you know, there's the Italian family, there's the Jewish family, there's the black family. I mean, how far do you want to take that? You know, knock on the door, there's somebody dying of diphtheria on the couch. <laughs> there's a guy beating up his wife in an alcoholic rage. I, you know, how real do we want to be? Yes. Yes. George Republic, I think. George. Yes. 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 
Yes. Okay, well, I hope I messed things up for you. That's what historians try to do all the time. Uh, but yes, that's right. And Reese actually was, as I said, cl closely involved with the Settlement House movement. There is a Jacob Reese settlement now that's in Queens. Uh, and there's, uh, he was involved with a couple others in the city as well. Um, yes? Yes. Yeah. Um, I did read some of those as a kid, actually, and they made a big impression on me. You know, uh -huh. I just had to survive. Really, yeah. You know, cool yeah. Well, you know. How realistic were those books? I never really read them. Uh, no, not, not very realistic. Oh, okay. You know, um, I mean, you know, uh, it, it, it's a brilliant sort of commercial uh, success. Uh, but I wouldn't rely on them for, for understanding the city at all. Um, I should say, too, that you mentioned it because, you know, the, the, how the other half lives in particular had a, a tremendous influence on a whole, several generations of people. I mean, for example, Francis Perkins, who, you know, was a Mount Holyoke alum, our most distinguished alum, I always say, uh, a major architect of the New Deal, obviously uh, a key person in, in, in Roosevelt's cabinet. Um, she talks about reading how the other half lives as an undergraduate and what a searing impact they had on her in, in, in Mount Holyoke in the late 1890s. Fiorello LaGuardia, the, the great progressive mayor of New York, also talks about um, how much Reese affected him. So there's no question that that influence, you know, continued for, for a number, at least a couple of generations. Um, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, no, well, part of the point I was trying to make was that, that Reese was sort of a loner, and, and, and you know, he, he was a brilliant publicist, uh, you know, uh, obviously a pioneer in photography, a very good reporter, um, but he kept his distance from organized groups, and, and I mean, you know, if you want to say, well, what, what did Reese accomplish in New York? I mean, you know, there are probably two concrete things you can point to. There's the abolition of the police lodging house system and also the, the raising of what was called Mulberry Bend at the bottom of Mulberry Street near the old five points. Um, and if you go down there now, of course, there's what they call Columbus Park, which is a, a park right there, and it was built in 1896. So those are two concrete things that Reese said, well, he really led that fight. But um, he's not really affiliated with the labor movement, with the socialists, with, uh, you know, f you know uh, progressive uh, uh, organizations very much. He's, he's really more, as I say, of, of, of a publicist. And, and really, by the early 1900s, those people and people who were getting involved in things like tenement house commissions and, um, you know, uh, you think about the next generation of photographers, Lewis Hine, photographing child labor. Uh, Reese is sort of an old fuddy-duddy already. He's, he's, he's seen as somebody who is sort of sentimental, uh, old-fashioned, uh, very 19th century. Um, and so he, he doesn't have much of a shelf life, so to speak, um, in the reform movements of the day. Uh, but I do think that he shows the way, in, in, you know, certainly in terms of photography and, and, and publicity. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, did, you said that he, he was sort of an evangelical, <coughs> came an evangelical Methodist, person, yeah. And that he was involved in, in, in that dimension of the reform movement. Did he have connection? Any of the major figures in the social gospel uh, movement? Yeah. And did, did he participate in that organi organized effort? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, really what happens is that when he begins to give this, um, this sly lecture show, The Other Half, How It Lives and Dies in New York, uh, he's pretty much limited to churches, and he gets very ticked off by the fact that many churches will not hear him, that they think this stuff is, you know, too disgusting, it's too much about vice, you know, this is really uh, inappropriate. Um, but there are a number of churches that do open their door to him, and they tend to be the people identified more with social gospel in New York City in that area. Um, and um, so, yeah, there is that sort of, again, informal connection. Um, he really, I think, saw himself more than anything else as sort of throwing down a gauntlet to Christians, saying, you know, um, what are you doing about this? Uh, it's not enough to stay in your church. Um, and, of course, you could make the argument, and he did in several levels, that, um, you know, this is all about you. It's not just about these people. Whether you want to look at politics, whether you want to look at, at public health, sanitation, uh, you know, the threat of riot, um, you can't ignore this anymore. 
Um, so yeah, he was very simpatico with the social gospel people, and many of them, as I say, opened their churches to him. Yes? By the way, the tenements weren't only downtown. Yeah, very good point. And some they of these pictures are actually... Downtown Manhattan, too. Absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely right. And as I said, three quarters of the city lived in tenements. So we're not talking about the other half here. Um, good point. Are we ready? One more? Are we talked out? Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is great. You know, I, I think it's all like one of the, uh, the minor mysteries. Can I tell us? Um, Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and also Reese, check out Reese House, it's right on 50-hour drive. Yeah, I'll show you the first public housing that would be in the United States. Hi. Thank you were terrific. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. That was wonderful. I appreciate you coming. It was fabulous. Are you here at the University? No, no, I'm just, my wife is on the uh, library association. Just hanging out. Yeah, and these lectures to me have always been interesting. You're just one of the outstanding. I, I, I love it.